Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. This is chapter 20. <laughs> Revelation chapter 20, I can't believe that we've come this far, uh, that we're finally in the home stretch. And so uh, you're more than welcome to uh, read along with us, especially if you have questions about Revelation chapter 20. Uh, otherwise, I would encourage you to go back to our first video and watch these in order. Uh, it won't take you long. Uh, every single video is only a couple of minutes, maybe 10 minutes uh, or 15 minutes at most. And really, we're just taking Revelation in, in bite-sized chunks, breaking it down just a step at a time. And today, certainly, uh, going to be a little short. And so your heading in your Bible might say the thousand years. And so just as a, as a, a um, admission, like the way we've been studying this is as a literal passage, right? We've been studying Revelation literally, and certainly that is one approach, okay? It's one approach. There are other forms of study for Revelation where everything is symbolic. Uh, there's some uh, forms of study where uh, everything is history rather than future. And so certainly there's more than one approach. And we didn't delve into all those approaches because we tried to keep it simple. And for me, I felt that the simplest approach was just to take the Bible at its word, right? Just to take things literally. And so that's kind of where we've been, uh, where we're at. So Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. Now remember, the speaker here is John. This is his revelation. He's been given this vision. An angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan. So clearly defined, right? Tells you point blank. This is the devil. And bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Can you imagine how different life will be on earth without the influence of the devil? We probably can't because he, he's been an influence our entire lives. That's all we've ever known. So it's hard for us to even Think about it. What, what would that be like to be rid of him? You know, the Bible describes him as the, the ruler of this world, that he is the God of the age, that he is a prowling lion, devouring. And now he's gone. An angel literally binds a chain around him and throws him into a pit. Not, not hell. Doesn't say he's sent into hell, right? It's more like he's sent into a, a prison. Okay? Satan's gone. Verse 4, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So, Satan is gone, and Christ reigns on earth for a thousand years. So, not only is the influence of the devil gone for a thousand years, but also Jesus is here. And it, and it feels like the way they're describing it is Jesus is here in physical form, right? He's here in bodily form for a thousand years. So you can imagine there are some limitations with being a physical being, right? You can't be everywhere at the same time. So it's possible that there will be many people on the earth who never see Jesus, right? But he's still the king, still influencing, right? A thousand years, a thousand years with no devil, and Jesus as king, our Messiah, established as king for a thousand years of the earth. And, and all of God's enemies are dead, right? All of God's enemies who defied him are dead. Now, 
I know you read that part about uh, the first and second death and you're like wondering, okay, where am I, <laughs> right? Where am I in all of this? Um, first Thessalonians 4.16, I think answers that. It says, for the Lord himself would ascend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. So again, this goes back to Revelation 19 when we talked about the trumpet blowing and Jesus returning on the white horse. And it says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So that's, that's us, right? That's, that's you and me. That's us. Can you imagine a thousand years, no more wickedness, no more evil, no more blasphemy, no more looking at all the, you know, the movies or the TV and, and wondering, okay, what's not so bad that I can watch this, right? I don't know if that means everything's going to be rated uh, G. <laughs> Every movie for the next 1,000 years will be rated G. But um, yeah, Christians are the majority. You're, you're, no longer, you're no longer the minority in the room. You're no longer the weirdo in the room. Christians are, well, we're not even just the majority. We're the, we're the only itty, right? We're the only, we're the only. A thousand years of heaven on earth. You know, that's, that's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if it sounds great, if it sounds great, I'm sure it will be. This makes me think about Hebrews 12.2. Hebrews 12.2 says, we look to Jesus. He is the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is why it's important, and we've been stressing this for the last couple of videos. This is why it's important that we look to Jesus now. Right? The author of Hebrews says, we look to Jesus. He is the founder and perfecter of our faith. There's nothing else to look to. There's nothing else to look forward to. Revelation is showing you the end right? The end of the game, the end of the book, the end of the puzzle. You know exactly where you need to go. So there's no point in diverting and going off and following something else, right? None. If, if I showed you a picture of a mansion, okay, and I said, guaranteed, guaranteed, this is your house in five years, guaranteed. And you knew it and you said, okay, that's my house in five years. Would you spend the next five years trying to buy a different house? No. No, you'd spend the next five years saving up for that house and saving up for all the furniture you're going to put inside of it, right? Your goal is that house because I already told you in five years, you're getting this house guaranteed. Well, revelation is a guarantee. It's a guarantee. So what do we do in the meantime? We don't waste our time building a different house or looking forward to a different home. This is it. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. We focus on him. We focus on our relationship with him because we're going to spend a thousand years with him. We're going to spend a thousand years with him on earth. So we need to be cultivating that relationship with Jesus now, right? Doing everything we can to cultivate a beautiful relationship with Jesus today. Because did you notice how our little paragraph ended? It ended with what happens next, right? What happens after the thousand years is over? What happens after Satan is released? I guess you'll have to find out next time. Thanks for watching, guys. See you later. Bye.